Starmer's abandoning of his tuition fees pledge is the latest addition where he's gone back on his word and made himself look thoroughly untrustworthy in the process. His excuse for dropping the promise to abolish tuition fees was that the economic circumstances have changed. That's the same excuse that Starmer rolled out when he dropped another key pledge, which was to take key British industries into public ownership. This is what he promised during his leadership bid. Pledge five, because of course there were so many. Common ownership. Public services should be in public hands, not making profits for shareholders. Support common ownership of rail, mail, energy and water. And outsourcing in our NHS, local government and justice system. And this is what he said when he appeared on Good Morning Britain in July last year. In the leadership election, February 2020, you said you support common ownership of rail, mail, energy and water. Rail, you are still planning to nationalise. Um, yes. Energy and water, yes. you are taking a pragmatic approach. Does that mean that you are planning to nationalise them or not? We're taking a pragmatic approach. So, yeah, what we're saying is, look, the market is not functioning properly. I think there's a business select committee out this morning that absolutely reinforces that. And people will feel that um, with the bills that they're receiving um, that are you know, far too high in many respects. So they know the market isn't working. So something's got to be done. So I'm not in a position of saying we're going to leave things as they are. But, not but we've got to recognise that after COVID, well, after COVID, we've got to be very careful about... Um, what we're able to spend going into an election. And I don't want a Labour Party that, you know, as it was in 2019, was basically saying we can spend on anything. Um, we've reversed those 2019 manifesto positions because we needed um, to, sh to show the country that we're credible, we're responsible on the economy. So we'll be pragmatic about yeah. it. But within the fiscal rules, with that, within the amount of money that we've got, we've got to make choices. Sure. Um, and if I've got choices to make, um, and there are other ways of fixing the market, yeah. then I'm a pragmatist and we'll go for the other ways of fixing the market. Well, back in 2020, Starmer wasn't so pragmatic because he promised that those pledges were set in stone no matter what hit the economy. Uh, over the next couple of years. Here he is talking to Andrew Neil on the BBC. You made 10 policy pledges for this campaign. Let's see how watertight they are. Can you guarantee that under your leadership, the 2019 Labour commitments to nationalise water, energy, rail, the Royal Mail, they'll all be in Labour's next election manifesto? I've made that commitment. Um, the pledges I've made indicate the direction of travel, but I am well aware that there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done between now and 2024, because that 2024 manifesto has to reflect mm. the state of the nation in 2024 right. uh, and face the late 20s. And things and change. 20th. I understand, well, I understand a lot that. Of things I will don't change. want you, I'm not consider the, the, asking the, the, you to write the manifesto, but those four industries will be in the Labour manifesto for nationalisation come 2024. They will. They're baseline um, indicators of where we're going. I think that we'll need oh, to think about how indicator. we do it. Well, they will be. They, they are. What I'm saying to the members here is we need to build the case from where we are now to 2024. Lots of things are going to change between now and 2024. It's not unlikely that we'll be leaving the EU without a deal. We don't know what the state of the economy oh. will be. Manufacturing could well make take a hit. So we're going to have to craft that 2024 manifesto looking forward. My pledges are an indication to our members as to what I think is important, the direction of travel and what we will can, build can on. Have a, a pledge is not an indication. A pledge is a word, is your word. It's a pledge. I'm not disputing that. I don't have any problem. So is that. it a pledge that these industries will be in your manifesto for nationalisation? Yes, it is. The point I'm making to you is the manifesto will have to have a lot more than that. Of course, it. I understand not a manifesto. that. Well, what this about university position. tuition fees then? Will you remain committed to scrapping them in They're your first term? They're all pledges, Andrew. So the answer to these questions is yes. So university but, tuition fees being scrapped will be in a Starmer manifesto? Yes, that's why it's a pledge. The next election. Okay. He is the most brazen liar in British politics. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. He's saying it'll be in a manifesto. Now he's saying, well, I'm pragmatic. It's not going to be in a manifesto. Let's be real. If that was a Conservative Party politician, if that was Boris Johnson, the BBC, the Guardian, would be frothing at the mouth. But in broadcast media, as I've said very frequently, the default is New Labour politics, which is why he's generally had a very easy ride on this stuff. Andrew Neil, whatever misgivings I have about the man, and I have many, He's the chairman of The Spectator. He's very clearly on the right. He's, I don't think he adheres to impartiality 
in any way, shape or form while he was at the BBC, but he's clearly a very good interviewer and he tries to find logical inconsistencies and incoherence in the broader argument. He did it there. Most people don't when Keir Starmer appears on broadcast because they, they agree with him. They like him. They don't want to see tuition fees scrapped. Bloody hell, 90% of them never paid a penny in tuition fees. Why do they care? Now, also part of that 2020 public ownership pledge was a promise to, quote, end outsourcing in the NHS. Speaking to Sky's Sophie Ridge, this was Starmer in January of this year. I want to have a look at one of your 10 pledges during your leadership yeah. campaign to become uh, uh, the leader of the Labour Party. Uh, and you said uh, this in it. You said, public services should be in public hands. Here we go. Uh, public services should be in public hands, not making profits for shareholders. And this is the key bit, end outsourcing in our NHS. So why have you changed your mind? Well, um, we're not talking about privatising the NHS or any public... Well, the NHS has always used um, elements from the private sector. GPs, for an example, is an but, example But, but your pledge, that. you said end outsourcing in our NHS, you, you've changed your mind. Yeah, well, look, the outsourcing of some issues and functions I don't think has been very effective. But if you take the NHS, the NHS has always used... Uh, GPs in private practice. That's always been part of it. For many, many years, the NHS has referred NHS um, you know, patients to the private sector to have operations, hip operations, knee operations, etc. I think we could be more effective at that. But I'm not talking about privatising the mm -hmm. NHS. The pledge is literally on the screen, Keir. It's literally, it's literally there in giant letters next to you. He's lying about lying. But again, apparently not a big deal. Not a big deal because he has a nice haircut. So how has Starmer fared against the other promises he made in 2020? This was his top pledge. Increase income tax for the top 5% of earners, reverse the Tories' cuts in corporation tax, and clamp down on tax avoidance, particularly of large corporations. No stepping back from our core principles. Hmm, interesting. Because on the Today programme, Starmer appears to have decided it's more important to appease the rich than pursue economic justice. Number one, why not stick to that pledge to increase uh, income tax for the top 5% of earners, who I, th I think you're suggesting could afford it, but also why not uh, reform capital gains tax so that it's the same rate as, as top-rate taxpayers currently pay on income? Well, Justin, we've got the highest um, sort of tax burden for, well, since the Second World War, and therefore, I mean, what we've had from the government is tax rise upon tax rise upon tax rise. And if they've proved one thing, it's that their high tax, low growth economy doesn't work. So, But for does me, taxing just, wealthier just, people just, not work? Just, so so just, just on this on this point, because, I mean, it's been something that Labour governments or Labour uh, um, Party recently has been very committed to. I'm just yeah. wondering the extent to which you now accept if you do, that taxing higher paid people and wealthier people more doesn't work. Yeah, Justin, let me just complete that mm. point and I'll, I'll try and incorporate it into the question you've just asked me. Um, I, I think, you know, what we've seen over the last 13 years is an economy that hasn't worked. It hasn't grown um, at any reasonable rate. That That's the net cause of the cost of living crisis and that reason why people's wages haven't gone up, cost of why their living standards haven't gone up. We've had, you know, people will be asking themselves after 13 years, am I any better off? And the answer to that is no. Now, the question you then put to me, well, wouldn't it be therefore sensible to raise taxes even higher? I think the high tax, low growth model uh, doesn't work. I think it's busted. I think this government has busted the economy. So it's not but quite just, the question just, I'm asking. No, 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 no hang on a second. But, Keir, the, the, but, the question I'm asking but, is whether people who've actually done pretty well uh, in recent times with the rise in asset prices, etc., and actually are wealthy in our society, should be paying more than they currently pay. And I think you're saying pretty clearly no. Well, Justin, that's because um, the my answer on what we do about the economy is we've got to grow the economy. And so I, I accept, Justin, I'm giving you a different answer to perhaps um, previous Labour leaders, which mm. would always go straight to tax and spend. I'm saying my central focus is on growing our economy. Now that seemed like a pretty long-winded way of saying, I believe in trickle-down economics, apparently putting Keir Starmer in the Liz Trust School of non-thought. Let's go back to that social justice pledge because it involved more than just student fees. It also promised to, quote, abolish universal credit and end the Tories' cruel sanctions regime. That pledge is now off the table too because speaking to the Centre for Social Justice in January, Shadow Work and Pensions Minister John Ashworth said, 
we actually agree with the concept behind universal credit, which was to bring six different benefits together into a unified system of support. That is the right thing to have done. And on what Labour would do about benefit sanctions, he said this, I want to be clear, there will be a conditionality regime within the benefit system. William Beveridge was clear in his white paper 80 years ago that people who did not engage sufficiently with trying to find work, that would lead to consequences. It should not be surprising that there will be conditionality, there will be rights and responsibilities running through the heart of social security. They love to talk about rights and responsibilities. John Ashworth was caught slagging off his own political party, talking to a mate, literally days before a general election. Where, where were the responsibilities there? They weren't there. They like to talk about responsibilities as long as they're for other people. One pledge that mattered to a lot of people in 2020, particularly those who did support Keir Starmer, who was seen as this arch remainer, involved freedom of movement after Brexit. As part of his pledge to defend migrants' rights, Starmer promised to, quote, defend free movement as we leave the EU. But now he's changed his tune again. Here's what he said during that Radio 4 interview. I mean, there are very important pledges I made, um, the vast majority mm. of which stand. But some of them, well, you know, some of them, are, one of them was, for example, was free, uh, defend free movement as we leave the EU. Well, we've left the EU, we're in a different situation. So uh, that's clear. Defend free movement as we leave the EU just doesn't mean the same as defend it until we leave the EU. And in January 2020, he even doubled down and said Labour should argue for the return of free movement. Those are the pledges that Starmer has explicitly broken. But there are others that his recent actions don't really seem aligned with. He promised to promote peace and human rights. But just months after winning the leadership, Starmer whipped Labour to vote in favour of the Tories' overseas operations bill. The bill, which has since been passed into law, makes British soldiers immune from prosecution for historic crimes, including human rights abuses, committed while serving abroad. Now, 17 members of the socialist campaign group of Labour MPs defied the whip. Nadia Whitone, Beth Winter and Olivia Blake were fired from junior ministerial roles as a result. More recently, Starmer allegedly threatened to suspend 11 MPs who signed a Stop the War Coalition statement urging a less confrontational stance by the UK government. They all subsequently withdrew their signatures. So, to recap. The promise to abolish tuition fees. Gone. Public ownership of utilities. Gone. Ending NHS outsourcing. Gone. Abolishing universal credit. Gone. Defending free movement. Gone. Increasing income tax on the top 5%. Economic credibility. Gone. Starmer comes across as a very slippery character, doesn't he? He is the Tucker Carlson of British politics, Aaron. He says one thing to his party audience, and he doesn't mean a word of it. You know, we recently discovered that Fox News hosts treat their audience with a kind of contempt where they'll tell them loudly on air that Trump really won an election. And then they'll go behind the scenes and say to their friends that they know it's all rubbish. That's exactly how Keir Starmer approached the Labour Party. His staff have recently wanted to present him as a figure of some uh, uh, aggression and, um, and fight and verve. Um, they know that he comes across as a kind of bland bank manager, and they want to suggest instead that he's someone who's got a fighting spirit in him. They planted a story in an interview that when he plays football, he shouts at other people on his football team because he really cares about winning. But their only strategy for showing that he has aggression is to show that he can beat up on his own party members, his own supporters, that he can attack the core constituency uh, that the Labour Party always relies on, whether it's young people who face a future indebted and they're going to get no help from the Labour Party, whether it's um, migrants and people from communities of migration um, who will see uh, an increasingly inhumane Conservative government uh, responded to by the Labour Party only by uh, calling it inefficient and not by challenging uh, a drive to the far right uh, in migration policies unimaginable a few years ago, um, whether it's public sector workers whose uh, push for, for decent pay and in order to save the public services they work for won't be supported by the Labour Party. Every different sector of the coalition on which the Labour Party relies, Starmer wants to attack in the name of trying to show that he's different uh, from Jeremy Corbyn. The problem is, of course, that um, it's very easy to beat up on students and on uh, members of ethnic minorities, and on public sector workers, and on people on universal credit who can't afford to heat their homes while energy companies rake in massive profits. It's easy to beat up on those people. It's a bit harder to confront the people that you need to confront if you want to change the way that British society works so that it works for more of us, for the many, you might say, and not just 
the few. It's easier to beat up on the poorest and most vulnerable than it is to confront the real challenges that we face. And in fact, a zealous commitment to beating up on the poorest and the most vulnerable can rule out the ability to actually tackle the challenges we face. We're in the laughable situation now that Emmanuel Macron, the embattled president of France, uh, so committed to neoliberal dogma that he's willing to push through legislation without parliamentary approval, um, is able to nationalize, to have a nationalized energy company and so cut bills for French people, a committed Thatcherite, and Keir Starmer won't go near the idea of a nationalized energy company to cut people's bills while people in Britain shiver and freeze. Why? Because that's an idea associated with the left. So the, the Starmer strategy of seeming like a tough guy by beating up on those who it's easy to beat up on just makes him look like a pathetic kind of schoolyard bully um, who gets his tail between his legs whenever a big dog comes over and hands over his lunch money immediately to energy bosses, landlords, um, and, uh, and, and corporate billionaires while attacking uh, the smallest kids in the playground. That's Keir Starmer's model of politics. There's something else going on here, I think, that we should be aware of. Um, I said Keir Starmer's the uh, Tucker Carlson of British politics. He's also the George Osborne of Labour Party politics. So he announces big changes in his plans and he says we're forced into this because of an economic uh, condition. COVID transformed the economic weather and so we just have to change everything we want to do. That's exactly what George Osborne did in relation to the banking crash. The Tories had promised to, uh, to, to match Labour's level of investment in public services in order to seem like a, a reasonable modern party. And then they seized a crash caused on Wall Street and in the city of London and used it uh, as thin justification for the kind of shrinking of the welfare state, shrinking of the social wage that they'd always been about, always wanted to do. Starmer is here taking a leaf right out of the Tory playbook. You take an economic crisis in which there is a desperate need. We've literally known this since the 1930s, a desperate need in the face of economic crisis to invest in jobs and skills and opportunities just for the reproduction of capital, let alone any more ambitious aspirations. And in that moment of economic crisis, instead, you reproduce the most right-wing dogma, which says, like a household, that a government must cut back its budget in the middle of a crisis. And you use that dogma to push forward an agenda which you always had anyway. There's a kind of contempt for basic truth here. There's absolutely no reason that COVID means that British soldiers should be able to torture people with impunity. And yet Starmer announces that he wants to push Labour MPs to ensure British soldiers can torture people with impunity. There's absolutely no reason that a worldwide pandemic means that we shouldn't criticise NATO, whose violence has, uh, has degraded and ruined tranches of our planet. But Starmer now announces that he'll discipline Labour MPs for criticising NATO. Every single one of his U-turns has in common not that it's caused by changing economic circumstances. That's just the right wing excuse. Every single one of his U-turns has in common that it fits with Keir Starmer's politics, which is to be a cop, to be a servant of the British state and its violence, and so not to uh, care about freeing people all over the world and here in Britain from the forms of violence and degradation and humiliation that are meted out to us, whether it's by the police or by oil companies or by uh, rogue landlords. Uh, instead, Starmer sides with those forces of power and wants only stability and criticizes the Conservative Party only for its chaos and not for presiding over a system which is rigged uh, to benefit only a few and not most of us. I think it's really important to say as well that Starman becoming Labour leader and the, the, the way that happened and the way that this entire deception has happened, I mean, it clearly was a massive deception, was such a failure of the media because there were so few people actually inquiring, well, he's saying these things, does he mean them? Is he going to back it up? What's his track record? He's presenting himself as this crusading human rights lawyer, friend of the Labour movement. Is that really who he is? And, you know, there were very few media outlets talking about that. Environ Media was one of them. I, I remember writing several articles saying, well, he, he voted for Owen Smith in the 2016 leadership election. He participated in the chicken coup. He um, has employed a bunch of people from, from Owen Smith's campaign, many of them on the party right. Does this tell us something? I mean, it's interesting, right? And yet there was not a single story like that from The Guardian or from the BBC or I think, to the best of my recollection, the New Statesman. And when I published those stories, you had people out there in the media, people like Paul Mason saying, this is propaganda, this is the Corbynites attacking Keir Starmer. No, we were trying to scrutinise a politician seeking a high office. That's what you're meant to do as a journalist. Apparently not if you're The Guardian, the BBC, or uh, Paul Mason. Mm -hmm.